Now, this is, this is another slightly speculative one and needs more research, but it's interesting, but I'll have to sort of talk through it a bit. And again, it took a bit of digging around to sort of get you there, um, to, to sort of make the figures work. This shows the regional imbalances in the balance of trade of goods for each of the different regions. Actually, not for each of the different regions. I've aggregated them. So what it shows you is that if this is positive, a, an area of the country is exporting more to the rest of the world than it's importing. If it's negative, it's importing more from the rest of the world than it's exporting to the rest of the world. So it's like the other thing. It's the same kind of relationship. It shows the, the balance of trade just in goods. So what I've done is lumped together London, the Greater South East, which is this blue bar here. Uh, and you've then got the rest of England, which is everywhere else, is red, and then Scotland in green, uh, Wales in purple, and a tiny, tiny slender thing for Northern Ireland, which you can't really see. What you see over time from 1996 is that the imbalance in London and the rest of the South East, the Greater South East, of imports being greater than exports is absolutely astronomical. And then for the rest of the country, well, it's positive to start with and then slips into negative territory, but nonetheless, it's tiny by comparison. That this imbalance in trade, and compensated for somewhat by Scotland and Wales as it happens, but this imbalance in trade is overwhelmingly generated in London and the South East. Largely, I think, or at least partly, because um, they don't have a large manufacturing sector, they don't export that much. This is, of course, just the goods trade. Those are the two cautions on it. This is just the trading goods, not services. Obviously, London will export a lot of services. It does financial services, so it exports. These are services you can export, so it will sell some of those to the rest of the world. That will help close it a little bit. There is another complication in that it's not always clear how much of this is just registering where goods arrive in the country, and there are big ports in the South East. So some of it is just capturing the fact that stuff is arriving there. Nonetheless, I think allowing for that, and there needs to do a bit more work to work out how much allowance needs to be make, made, I think the pattern is fairly clear. That this imbalance in the current account, this consumption from the rest of the world and not exporting to the rest of the world, that the whole country, on the aggregate, ends up with, is largely determined by what happens in London and the South East. So this is kind of another win, if you like, for that London-centric version of growth, that they can carry on buying from the rest of the world and not exporting to the rest of the world. And you can pay for it because you have essentially a large financial system that is centred on London. And then when the thing goes horribly wrong, you kind of make everybody else pay for it. And it produces huge, not just regional inequalities, I think it's helped contribute to the very much widening uh, spread of inequalities of wealth in this uh, country. All of which opens you up to the question, so where is this, this, this so-called recovery uh, coming from? The starting point is austerity is failing. Um, there's no recovery in investment, there's no recovery in earnings. Austerity was always a bad idea. There was never any purely economic justification for doing austerity. No, none at all. Uh, any pretense that such a thing existed, I think, was, well, uh, either George Osborne simply doesn't know what he's talking about or he's, he's being disingenuous on this. And the, the reason's fairly simple. Like, it gets you back to uh, an explanation associated with John Maynard Keynes, the, economists from the 1930s, writing about the Great Depression, trying to understand why the Great Depression went on so long. And the story he tells is basically that if you take a whole uh, economy, every time I spend some money, someone else must earn money. It has to be the case. If I go to the shop and buy something, I pay 80p or whatever for a bag of crisps, uh, I hand over the money, the shopkeeper earns the money. Every time I spend, someone else earns. Every time anyone here spends, someone else earns. That has to be the case. That is the relationship necessarily. So if you take the whole economy, every time everybody's spending, other people must be earning. Which means if you cut your spending, other people are earning less. What happens in a recession? Loads of people cut their spending. Loads of people therefore earn less, you get a recession. If government then turns up and says, hey, we're also going to cut our spending, you can only make the recession worse. You're not going to improve the situation. So there is no economic case for austerity. And this isn't some like crazy notion. You can go to any university <laughs> in the city dig out an economics textbook, he'll tell you something like this story. So austerity doesn't really work in terms of producing uh, growth or uh, rising earnings or investment or any of these things. It doesn't really happen. I think the government that we have genuinely believe that it might. I think there's, a, there's a, apparently a Belgian saying that everyone likes the smell of their own farts. 
And there's a kind of extent to which they, they perhaps fell victim to this, that they kind of believe their own nonsense to, to some extent in this one. Nonetheless, by the start of this year, if not slightly earlier, I think it was clear that it wasn't working. What the economy is good at is producing bubbles, very much so. Well, we don't really make very much else, but bubbles is something, uh, asset price bubbles, it's something that we're good at. And what you see from at least the start of this year is that government policy has, I think, ended up encouraging bubbles in housing. That you have help to buy, uh, subsidising, you know, return to 95% mortgages, this time government subsidies, yes, subsidising uh, ludicrously large mortgages, not building new houses or anything, you're just subsidising the mortgages. You've got 370 billion of quantitative easing. You've got forward guidance, which is Mark Carney, the new Bank of England governor's phrase. Uh, little unclear about what he exactly means, but it seems to boil down to a promise that interest rates will definitely stay low for the next few years. All of which is enough to start to stoke up a certain amount of activity um, in the housing market. At the minute, this is, I'm going to show you the graph next, but at the minute this appears to be only emerging in London, which is largely why you're having this pattern of growth of jobs, particularly in London, low paid jobs in London, an increase in consumer borrowing that seems to be driven by what's happening in London, and it's not spreading out so much to the rest of the country yet. So that bubble, that house price bubble, may be emerging just in London. Now this looks like a bit of a mess, but I'll explain it. The, what you see here is a ratio of house prices to earnings from May 1999 to, uh, I think that's slightly mislabeled at the bottom, it's actually going up to about May, uh, May this year, I think, mm -hmm. uh, on this end. And what you see is the ratio of house prices to earnings, to average earnings, again by region. So it's how much a house costs relative to how much the average earnings are, how much most people earn. Shown as a ratio here. What you've got is London over this period of time, houses in London are very expensive. Uh, you see over this period of time, you've got, um, yeah, the labelling is hopelessly wrong. I'm really sorry about that. I'm quite was added to another list of technical problems there. What you see here is London's always above. This is the London line here, and here's everyone else. This is the rest of the country, all the different regions show average house prices to earnings. This drop here, despite the labelling, is um, the crash of 2008, right? So you get a drop in prices, and you get a drop in prices relative to earnings. It comes down somewhat, and it's still really high, to be honest with you. You're talking about houses are eight times average earnings, that's a lot. You then, since that crash, the rest of the country, which drops also, I mean, it basically follows the same pattern, drops, but then doesn't recover. London, on the other hand, carries on like this. Now, the point with the house price earnings ratio is this, this is a good sort of indicator of a housing bubble. It's not, it doesn't tell you directly whether there's a bubble. To a certain extent, you don't know if there's a bubble until the thing is burst. Um, <coughs> but it might be an indicator that something like this is happening. The reason being that if your house is very valuable, uh, or houses in general are valuable, and you have to borrow more and more and more to try and get one because it's valuable relative to the amount that you're earning, that starts to look like a kind of speculative bubble <laughs> emerging. That the price of houses is running way ahead of what people are actually earning. It must be something else driving up the house price. It's not people's increase in earnings or increased demand for housing necessarily for somewhere to live. It's something else that's taking place that's talking up house prices, property prices over there. And anecdotally, this kind of looks, uh, looks to be the case. So 40% of, of uh, housing purchases in London uh, over the last 12 months were, were cash, were you know, without anyone using a mortgage. That's not going to be people, that's not people in general buying somewhere to live, that's people buying somewhere to speculate, that's somebody just turning up with money and buying somewhere. Um, all the estate agents report very, very large amounts of activity, particularly for very expensive properties in London, particularly for money arriving from overseas. That doesn't necessarily mean it is from overseas. It could be a, quite a nice, neat little tax avoidance thing that, that people are going in for. But nonetheless, sort of anecdotally, it suggests there's a lot of money flowing into London uh, housing market, property market more generally, certainly relative to the rest of the country. So you can kind of see what might be a bubble appearing there. So what's the future uh, at this point? Well, the key, I think, remains investment. If investment picks up, then maybe everything else, all the other usual indicators of what's going well in the economy, will start to look better. Firms are sitting on so much cash that it ought to be very, very cheap and easy for them to invest. The fact they're not, despite these enormous cash hoards, is quite telling in itself. Um, your attitude to whether that means they will start to invest at some point will vary depending on what kind of economist you are. 
my own feeling at this point. Well, it could happen. It could just about happen that a bubble pulls us forward. Can you tell us about why you think they're not investing? They're sitting on lots of money. Yeah, okay. Well, this is. They're they're not. They're well. They don't need to. You see, if you if you're sitting on lots of money, you can. There's there's a number of reasons why you don't invest as as a company. Um, One of them is you don't expect to see a a return. You don't expect to make much money back from that. Uh, you might not expect to see a return from that because you believe that future prospects for investment are not particularly great. That you might think the economy is in such a state there's no need for you to invest. Uh, you might think that the, the com- pressure of competition from elsewhere is so great you don't want to invest. You might also, at this point in time, think, well, to any of you, why, why invest in something boring that, that will you know, create jobs and stuff when you can go and stick this in a financial market? Or you can stick it, it ultimately in some nice uh, fat property in London somewhere. You know, why would you invest in stuff that produces jobs when there's loads and loads of other options for you to take over here? So I think what's happening is a combination of very, very uh, low expectations about future prospects for the economy. That might be shifting. There's some evidence that's shifting a bit. And also, because we do live in this weird financialised world, it's always just better to stick your money in some financial thing. You can go and put it over there, put it into property, put it into any old thing, rather than investing in offices, machinery, equipment, whatever. That's kind of risky and difficult and for all sorts of reasons you don't want to do it. The other thing gives you a very high rate of return very quickly. And if you want to make a profit, well, it's, it's clear. So I think that's, that's partly what's going on, uh, largely actually what's going on at this point. If that turns, if they start to invest, then maybe everything else will pick up. However, the labour market is so slack uh, and in particular, trade unions are, are weak. You know, they've still got members, but they're weak. The chances of that increase in investment turning into increases in most people's earnings um, over the next, let's say, 18 months or so actually looks fairly unlikely. You know, there might be some improvement for some people, but the average, I think, is not going to change. Not when you have so many people underemployed. If you're underemployed, you're basically saying you will work uh, more hours for the same or less money. That's what you're kind of reporting. So you can increase investment, create more work, not necessarily pay anyone any more money to do the work. So it may not turn into an increase in earnings. We may actually see earnings continue to fall uh, over, over the next period of time. And of course, there's this 20% stock of youth unemployment. I mean, Marx called it the reserve army of labour. And that's kind of precisely what you've got here. If you've got one in five young people out of work, then let's say you get everybody else employed, you can, you've still got this one in five young people sitting there looking for a job. It's an immediate pressure on wages, on earnings. So chances of recovery there are quite uh, limited. If the bubble spreads outside of London, that might get us back to something like 2003, 2004, where real earnings are actually flat or falling, but everyone can borrow more money. And they can go and buy stuff, and it picks up a bit of consumer spending, particularly for kind of better off people, towards the top end of the income scale. Um, And that might drive a bit of growth elsewhere in the country. It does mean you've got rising household debt, falling earnings. This is exactly the pattern we had prior to the crash of 2008. So it's not so much a recovery as a kind of reversion. It's kind of resetting the clock back to some point around about 2005, 2006. Only this time round, you don't have a government committed to trying to increase spending on public services, which in fits and starts New Labour did. You've got a government committed to hammering away at public spending. Uh, and with earnings falling much more dra- dramatically, partly in consequence. So it's a kind of reversion. It's sort of Groundhog Day process that we're going through here. And if you wanted a kind of short version of what's happened to much of the world, or at least the developed world, over the last 30 years or so, it is this kind of pattern of financial bubbles, property bubbles that burst, and then there's a crash, and then the thing builds up again, and then it bursts, and then you go through this kind of cyclical process. And what happens in 2008 it's just a particularly extreme version of that. And now we seem to be going straight back onto, onto the same track again. So, quickly, what are the alternatives? Well, I mean, there's lots of different ways you can cut this. I mean, what tends to happen is what you think about what's wrong with the economy tells you about what you think you might want to do about it and what you, what you might want to do about it. Uh, first one, I think, is just end austerity. There, there is no uh, purely economic justification for it. If you want to think about why it's happening, your reasons get you out of economics as a kind of science of how money moves around, if you like, and into political economy. Um, if economics is, is the machine, political economy is who benefits from the machine running, right? So it's a political economy question behind austerity. Austerity basically means that you have a government that's saying, we don't care what happens to the real economy, ultimately. We are privileging uh, financial assets above anything else. 
So we may well know it's damaging the real economy, but because we're doing austerity, we're saying we will repay this debt, whatever else happens. So it creates a kind of hierarchy of things the government is concerned about. So it's a political economy thing. If you have a government that's very concerned about finance, austerity can start to look like a good idea, even if it damages the rest of the country. Uh, that's kind of the short version, I think, of why it's happening. Um, you'd want to transform finance. This lurks at the heart of the thing. Uh, I mean, in current quantitative easing, well, happily, that's, that's, I think, going to start to happen anyway. Um, the slightly old-fashioned thing there is nationalised banks and place under public control. I mean, of course, we, we have nationalised banks, uh, but what we did was let exactly the same people carry on running them, uh, which was generous of us. Exactly the same people with some kind of treasury mandarins um, helping them out via UK uh, financial investments. Um, so if you're going to nationalise banks, you want them to be under some sort of public democratic control. You want banks that make sensible investments in things people need. There is no reason why banks should not now be lending money to small businesses or to public works programmes, whatever you want to do, really. You know, they've got, they're flush with cash. They're, they're reasonably, reasonably uh, or at least the better parts of them are reasonably secure. Um, you probably want to create regional local banks. There is a very strong case of breaking up RBS in the middle of this. The, the reason you do this, I think, is twofold. One part of it is a political economy point. If you have a massive institution, like RBS, for instance, lumbering around a place, then your, everybody else gets tied to it when it's doing well. Because you think it's doing well, this is creating whatever you think it's creating, money for people, jobs, whatever. And then when it does badly, everybody else is still tied to it. Because RBS doing badly means the rest of us suffer as well. So there's a political economy point here, that when you have a large institution like that, it distorts every other decision you want to make. So break it up is the obvious thing to do. Just split the thing up into lots of different bits. Um, write off uh, the bad debts, you know, force its various shareholders and bondholders to actually you know, feel a bit of pain out of all of this, and create regional and local banks for the second reason, which is that if you have an economy based on money, you're going to have banks of some sort. It is better that those banks have a kind of sensitivity to the people that are using them. You're more likely to get that. You're more likely to get an awareness of what a local economy is like in a local bank than you are in some massive financialized institution like RBS or any of the other major banks in this country. And if you've got local and regional banks, they can start to make sensible, reasonable, long-term investments, make loans to um, local businesses and local projects and all the rest of it. Close the current account deficit. Well, sometimes someone like um, Vince Cable picks up on this one. If you want to close the gap between imports and exports, that reduces your dependency in finance. Um, someone like Nick Cable, Nick Cable, yes, Vince Cable. Nick played Vince Cable. Nick, uh, Vince Cable will pick up on this. Uh, and he has picked up on this. And what he says, oh, we have to export more. We just have to sell more into the rest of the world, more stuff. That will close the current account deficit. Th there are two problems with this. One is that if you're trying to sell into the rest of the world, that's an incredibly competitive, difficult place to sell into. Well, it really is. It's, it's not like what you're actually, what that can turn very rapidly back into is you lot are all paid too much so we can't sell to the rest of the world. So that doesn't look too pleasant. The more pleasant version of it, of course, is, oh, don't worry, we can sell uh, really advanced electronics, uh, we can sell, you know, designs for whatever you're selling designs for, we can sell software engineering, we can do all this high-value added stuff, which sounds very nice, it just doesn't create jobs. It doesn't. So you're not really resolving a wider problem in employment there. If you really want to close the current account deficit, you want to reduce imports. If you want to reduce imports, well, that means a kind of something along the lines of, of what used to get labelled import substitution. The two obvious ones, or the two that sort of stick out in terms of Britain being a weirdly large importer of stuff relative to the size of its economy, are food. We're a very, very large importer of food by value, and um, energy. So it means turning things as far as possible, in the case of food production, to relocalise value chains in the way that you don't get meat transported halfway around Europe before it turns up in the shops here, for instance. Uh, in the case of energy, it means, I think, making use of the fact that this is basically a wet, windy island, uh, that there is a lot of potential there to exploit this fact and do things like installing renewable power on a very, very wide scale. Um, in the case of wind farms, in particular, ideally owned by local communities, there's no great advantage to having, say, EDF or whoever turning up and sticking a load of wind farms in some otherwise unspoiled part of the world, but there might be some advantage to that local community if they own the wind farm themselves. That would help, I think, overcome some of the obvious and understandable objections to this sort of thing. I think you need, an in, uh, this is lurching into the 70s, but I think you do need something like an industrial policy. A government that says 
these things are important. Not necessarily just important for growth or whatever, but important, socially important. So you might well say there is a socially overwhelming need to do something about climate change to reduce our carbon footprint. This therefore means that these particular sectors of the economy will get investment. They will get assistance. We will attempt to create jobs in these particular places. Redistribution. Um, there's all sorts of reasons why you want to do redistribution. The one that's, that's striking, I suppose, is that I, I don't see any way to close the regional gaps uh, without some process by which you redistribute from rich people who are mostly in one part of the country to less well-off people who are mostly in another part of the country. There's a redistribution that you use the tax system uh, to do this. Uh, the growth or whatever isn't going to close that regional gap any other way. Um, you can change the way that we think about ownership of assets of companies and the rest of it. I mean, the rhetoric for, God, 30 years now, really, is that there is only one way that you can think about how we should own any asset in the economy, and that is always private, and it's always profit-seeking, therefore. Well, you know, we've had that. We've had that in banking, and it was disastrous. So we've got it in power uh, generation, and it doesn't really work out too well for most of us. There is a need to talk about how you can change ownership and therefore change the focus of what these companies are doing. Now, that could mean sort of traditional public ownership. Uh, for very large infrastructure, then it kind of makes sense to have things like the national grid in direct state ownership. It's too big to do anything else with. But on a more local basis, then you can talk about, for instance, community ownership of renewable projects, community ownership of farms, that sort of thing. The energy price freeze, uh, by the way, is nice, uh, of course. I mean, should David Mil David Ed Miliband get uh, elected? You know, that would be a, a real shocker, uh, wouldn't it? Um, if should he get elected, then the price freeze is good. This will directly benefit people in this country, clearly. Um, it's just nowhere near enough. You know, you've got 20 months of this thing, and then what happens afterwards is anyone's guess. We've already seen, by the way, squealing from the power companies about this horrible infringement on their right to charge whatever the hell they like. Uh, so I think there's also, if you're going to be serious about doing something like this, there's also the need to address the issue again of ownership and control over these major resources, which if he attempts to implement an energy price freeze, he will almost certainly run directly into. So that's the end of the, the presentation. It's kind of a run through pretty much everything, but I'm open for questions and discussion the rest now. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah? I'll go with you first. I wanted to know is how much of a bubble to cause by the fact in this country, every board of a country of a company has a legal obligation to maximize shareholder profits over and above any other consideration. Um, should I take a few or two? Okay. Um is it illegal? Well that, I mean that's I know that there's this legal obligation. I think what you've got is what you've got with that is it's basic to the structure of a, of a kind of private company, right? There's, there's a legal obligation of a company to maximise shareholder uh, profits. I mean, this is just what private corporations do, and, and it's what they always have done. It's what they were set up to do. Which is not the overriding legal obligation in all countries. Only this no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a similar thing for anywhere. For anywhere that has a corporation structure, then they might also have introduced a few things saying, and you must also watch out for X, Y, or Z social attributes. Um, the problem with just... You see, what I think this gets you back into is the issue of control. That you can set up a system in which there are large parts of it. You have private companies which are, in the end, determined by uh, returns to their shareholders. Whatever the legal situation is, that's what a private company is doing. It has to produce a profit. It has to. So it's always going to do that. If it doesn't do that, it goes bankrupt. To so get away from that, you can try and introduce some legal restrictions on how they can make profits and how you can steer them. The trouble is the drive is still very much pushing to try and make profits, and that will, one way or other, try and get around legal restrictions. So if you wanted to break away from that, and there's an argument for doing this in great chunks of the economy, you know, certainly for utilities, I think, that it's, very, it's bad. It's just bad to have major energy companies driven and determined by private profit. What it means is they don't invest, and then when they get forced to invest, they pass the costs on to the rest of us. That's basically what's happened over the last year or so. If they are under some sort of public control, even just a sort of notional public control of the state owning them, then that wouldn't necessarily be the case. So you could see how you can make corporations behave somewhat better with some legal changes to what a corporation looks like. If you say instead it's just you must maximise return to shareholders, you could introduce and you must not damage the environment and nuance it somewhat from that point. 
you could introduce things there. But I don't think it completely resolves the problem of the kind of corporate form as such. Sorry, at the back. Uh, I've got so two questions really. Shall I have you got much data about Liverpool? Because what seems to happen around me is actually a property boom in Liverpool. Like there's a um, massive expansion in house building and refurbishment going on at the minute. And um, you're doing about a like, five minute radius from where I live. It's quite, quite a lot odd. They are the poor area of Liverpool. Mm -hmm. There's this massive boom going on there. But also, I know there's um, regional banks work well in Germany, but I think there will be a few banks in Spain that can have it there. They're not a massive disaster from what I know about in Spain. So it's just the usual banks that sell the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Shall I take a couple of minutes? Yeah. Let's go. Yeah, two things, and they're both linked with the environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. You said in passing you weren't going to address the question of whether growth is a good thing. But that surely is essential to noticing that we live in a real world and that you know, we can't go on growing up our physical consumption indefinitely. Um, and economists have been living in cloud cuckoo land for 200 years and eventually reality is going to catch up with them. So that's one point. The other point is on the energy companies. Mm -hmm. Freezing uh, fuel prices might be good for individuals, it might even be good for the country in a financial situation, but it is not good for the planet. We actually need to be assuming that energy is going to get progressively more costly so that we actually do spend money on using the energy we have more efficiently, on generating it from renewable sources, insulating our roofs and all that sort of thing. You know, the cheap energy days have got to be gone. One more? Um, yeah, um, I was just wondering how would you propose measuring what I would call good growth? Um, what, what, what would be the alternative to GDP? And I would have to say, I am working in the industry, and if you freeze energy prices, it's going to be the biggest bloody disaster ever. It really is. <laughs> and no, I don't work for the big six, by the way, either. <laughs> Right. Um, so, okay, let's start with Liverpool's Sparkas. Um, yeah, I, uh, look, it's, it's sort of early days on the housing boom or not. I mean, I, as far as I know, housing starts, number of houses being, not as far as I know, this is what figures say, the number of housing starts over the last few months or so has picked up. So there are slight, finally, after reaching absolute sort of rock bottom. It's kind of over the last two years, I'd say. No, I think it's, 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 it's well, recent. It's around, around this. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay, fine. The ones I've seen, it's, it's, it's slightly more recently than that, but it's just picked up over the last few years or so, um, which is, again, and construction. I mean, construction is very, very cyclical. It is. Construction employment, after crashing uh, down like this, has uh, started to pick up again, which is an absolute sure sign that construction is happening. So certainly in London, and particularly in central London, these are definitely taking place. There's huge building sites all over the place. It may now also be spreading properly into the rest of the country. Right, which may then feed into rising house prices, people borrowing more money. Uh, that already seems to be happening to some extent. Borrowing more money, spending more, therefore it's boom, therefore we're all back on the track of 2006 heading into the crash of 2008. I mean, that's the real problem here. The crash of 2008 was serious. Some of its consequences were dealt with, but not very many of them. Massive stock of debt is still there. Households are still very heavily indebted. indebted. Now, we've got a government, I think, that's rather cynically encouraging another round of speculation and house price bubbles and the rest of it in order to G the economy up. But it's not done anything about the underlying problems at all. This is just like, crudely, this is something that needs to happen over the next 18 months by, you know, pick a random date, May 2050. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's the kind of time frame I think they're looking at. I, I mean, that's, and this is, it's a rerun of 2002, 2003, 2004, but worse because the government's subsidising it this time round. And you've got the legacy of the last bubble, which wasn't really cleared out of the way. Uh, so cynically, you might say, this is determined by a kind of electoral time frame. If you're even more cynical, I've got a very cynical friend, who says, uh, no, no, it's not that. It's that. The government knows very well they're going to lose the next election. They're just parking this ticking time bomb uh, for the next government. Uh, which, of course, you, know, you can see 
that every time you elect Labour, you have a catastrophic <laughs> house price uh, crash and, and everything else happens. It's, you know, it's possibility. I, I think that's a little too cynical, even for, even for the coalition at this point in time. But that, that's kind of what happens. The second part was Sparkass and, and local banks and regional banks. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the other one, people talk about Sparkass as the good regional banks in, in Germany. What were the other ones called? Land, Landsbank. Yes, I mean, yeah, I mean th these are regional banks, but they were the ones who were completely up to their neck in the most stupid, stupid financial innovation, so-called, all the way over in America. Uh, there's an interesting story there about deregulation and the banks trying desperately to find something that will produce a return for their shareholders. A lot of their shareholders were, in fact, the, the sort of regional authorities in Germany who wanted to get lots of money back from them. So there's a kind of tangle of political and regulation, all sorts of issues. But basically, land banks, they get absolutely up to their necks in financial chicanery that they don't understand. I mean, frankly, you know, JP Morgan, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, they don't really understand it, right? Lands Bank really, really don't understand it, more to the point, get taken for a ride by the big American banks uh, and crash horribly. So Sparkass and better, Lands Bank, awful. Both regional banks. The regional banking structure does not solve everything. It's what you tell the bank to do and who's running the bank. And that's the central bit that we've kind of skirted around for five years now. You know, there's this presumption that the people, it's incredible. It's a presumption that the people in charge of the banks, bar a couple of token figures, Fred the Shred or whatever, uh, are the people who are still competent to be running the banks five years later, having just driven them all into the wall over here. I mean, the, the instances of anyone serious getting done for anything serious uh, related to the financial crashes, you know, I mean, hard pushed. I mean, a couple of the small fry, right? A few people with hands in the till sort of there. It's Bernie Madoff and that kind of thing. But the only country I can think of that's been serious about trying to prosecute Anybody who's really in charge is Iceland. And the only time, of course, here where you start to hear about a banker who might get done for anything is when he's filmed on tape buying crack cocaine. You know, which is like, banker takes drugs, shock horror. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so the second set of questions, which are related. How do you measure good growth? Um, well, I, there's lots of ways to do this, and there's a lot of interest in measuring well-being. Not happiness. There's a bit of flurry about trying to measure happiness. It's a bit vague. But well-being is a more sort of general sense of what makes people... Well, what contributes their well-being, right? So what makes them better people and what makes it a better planet to live on, that sort of thing. Uh, it's interesting research. I think it's still very early days because the, the difficulties, you can say easily, wouldn't it be nice to measure well-being? Wouldn't it be good to talk about something other than just like GDP? Which wouldn't come down to it. GDP is just adding up the number of transactions that take place. I mean, this is, there's no reason this has anything to do with welfare at all. It kind of, sort of, has had for the last 50 years or so. But, I mean, the guy who invented the measure, Simon Kuznets, giving evidence in 1934 to the U.S. Senate, basically says, look, you know, guys, whatever you want to do with this, don't really use it as a measure of welfare. It's like, it's counting other things. Don't use it as a proxy for how, how well off, how well-being of the rest of society. But, of course, everybody does use it as that because it's a nice, convenient measure. And for about, let's say, 50 years, from 1947 to God, probably the early 2000s, maybe a bit before that, in this country... Rising GDP meant most people were getting better off. That, those two things marched together. So it sets in people's heads. GDP goes up, that's good. I'll have a job, I'll have more money, I'll get nice things, great. Uh, that's broken. It's broken quite starkly, I think, in America. It's broken somewhat less starkly here. Um, it will be interesting to see, if GDP is now going up, what happens to real earnings. My guess is that we're not going to see anything like the same improvement at best in real earnings for most people. So come up with a better measure. Well, given the problems at the moment with just going, let's measure well-being, let's try and ask people how they're feeling and put a number on it. And some of this stuff you can't put a number on. You know, what value are you going to actually attribute to having an unspoiled environment? It is not something. It's not just something you can't put a number on, really. It's, you probably shouldn't. You know, you probably shouldn't stick a number on it because you put a number on it, particularly if you put a number with like a pound sign at the start, someone goes, well, if it's really worth that much money, why don't we sell it off? You know, this is a problem. There's a problem with saying, let's go and value. You know, there's this big push over the last 20 years or so. There's a bit of an environmental movement. So we must attribute value to things that basically people just find inherently good. But as soon as you do that, someone's going to turn up and say, that means I can make money out of it. And you'll lose the thing you think is inherently good. With the best of intentions. You know, with the best intentions at the start. But there's a risk in that. So I tend to think that you can be quite crude about this. What matters to people? Well, jobs. But not just any old jobs. But Reasonably good, secure jobs. So you come up with some measure of, is it a decent, secure employment? Is that what we're creating? That's one part of it. I tend to think average earnings isn't a bad one, median earnings, because it picks up an inequality as well, and it gives you a nice, clear measure of inequality. 
I mean, at the moment, average, the cricket average, is wildly distorted by the fact we have a very, very unequal distribution of income in this country. I mean, extraordinarily uh, unequal and probably getting worse at the moment, give or take. Um, so the average isn't that great. Median, uh, which is where you take whoever's line everybody up in a line, take the person in the middle, how much are they earning, that would be a far better uh, uh, measure there. Those would be two fairly crude, but importantly, I think, relatively easily understood measures that we could start to talk about. And it's the easily understood bit that I think is important, because you want to communicate to people, this is what, this is kind of what the economy we're doing could be measured in. The other one is environmental impact, carbon output, something along those lines. If you take those three, one of them needs to go down, two of them basically need to go up, that would give you a pretty good indicator of whether the economy is any use or not for most people. It doesn't cover everything, but it gets you, starts moving in the right direction. Now, the difficult question uh, was the one you raised, which is uh, environmental crisis, is growth even a good thing? Um, the, the, the nuance here is like, what I don't think we should fall into the trap of is just going, here is GDP. Uh, we know this is a flawed measure. So therefore, we, if they want it to go up, that produces bad things, so let's make it go down, right? So I don't think degrowth, the argument for degrowth, let's just shrink the economy, is a particularly plausible one. Because we know what happens if GDP goes down. As things stand, when GDP goes down, unemployment goes up, poverty goes up, inequality goes up, you can, you know, all these bad things occur. So there has to be something else that, that we do uh, with growth. Now, is growth as such always a good thing? Well, no, because we do live on uh, a, a finite um, planet. Uh, and if you... God, if, if you start to extrapolate some of the figures on this, uh, Tim Jackson in Prosperity Without Growth does provide some of the figures on this about the amount of damage an economy that contains, a world that contains 9 billion people, all of whom have a kind of GDP consumption level similar to what is enjoyed in Western Europe now, is absolutely catastrophic, as things stand. Now, I think that's not so much an argument about let's not chase GDP, it's an argument about how do we reform the economy. Uh, how do we change how people relate to each other? How do we make it so that simple monetary transactions aren't the thing that's pursued and held up as the absolutely overriding goal of everything we can do uh, out the other side? So that is that, that would be my argument about um, why growth isn't just the be-all and end-all. The problem we've got, I think, is that I can have an argument like that, and I can have that argument in this room. Um, what I would like to be able to do is also and I, hope, I think everyone probably feels like this, you want to be able to talk to loads and loads of other people. And the problem after 50 years, that basically GDP is great, is that unless you're going to start from at least saying something about GDP, it's hard to open up a conversation about anything else. Now, I think we're in an interesting time at this point, because the big sell in GDP was GDP goes up, you're better off. If that's broken down, well, that opens up all sorts of other possibilities to talk about other things in the economy. GDP is going up, are you any better off? No, you're not. It's simple, right? <laughs> Your child has just graduated from university. Are they employed? No, they're not. It's not, you know, but GDP is still rising. Uh, and you have David Cameron and all the rest of it. It's going up. Oh, look at our magic number. You need to feel better about this. You know? So there's an argument you can start to open up there. So I think it's important we can at least talk about the thing from sort of, a sort of political point of view. It's also just, unfortunately, it's the only bloody measure we've got for a whole load of things. So you kind of have to use it at least a little bit.